Greetings everyone, this is David and today's video is going to be a refutation of Ibn al-Qayyim. A couple of months ago I made an article on this very topic on Substack, so this video is going to be the video version of that article with, with a couple of more citations I suppose. And uh, before I get into this video, I would also like to say that the general idea of this poem, I will say from my impression, is that it pretty much skips over a lot of the basic Christian beliefs and presuppositions. So that's going to be the main focus of this video. If you have, you know, it's basically probably going to happen. We're probably going to have a lot of Muslims in the comment section uh, making, you know, changing the topic and making arguments like one plus one plus one. It does not uh, it does not equal one. You know, for arguments like that, I made a stream with Dr. Bo Branson on the logical problem of the Trinity exactly about that topic. And I have other videos that talk about different kinds of topics as well. So I will recommend you check them out, which you can see in the top right and in the link in the description below as well. Having said all of that, um, we can now begin. And the first part of his poem is basically asking Christians what kind of a God we worship, right? Because we believe Christ is God and he was crucified on the cross. So kind of rhetorically ask, what sort of God is this? Well, I'm going to answer the rhetorical question literally. And I think a good summary will be to say that God created man so that man might participate in God's goodness. And so in the garden, man disobeyed God. He didn't follow God's commandments. Uh, he fell and he fell into sin. You know, we will call this original or ancestral sin. And then God condescended to man. He tried, he still tried to be with man. He tried, still tried to help him. He sent him angels. They rejected them. He sent them prophets and these people persecuted his prophets. And then eventually God sent his own word, clothed him in body and soul and sent him to us. To preach the gospel and as the trend is so consistent throughout the old testament into the new testament he was also likewise persecuted and he was crucified on the cross now christ who was prophesied about in the old testament such as you know from prophet isaiah and ma many other prophets in the old testament, all throughout the old testament as well uh, christ by taking on human nature has healed or human nature which was being corrupted by sin. And by being crucified, which was part of God's plan, uh, by being crucified, he has took sin on his own body and he has destroyed it. By destroying it, um, he has led us to eternal life. And so in order to become partakers of that, we must participate in his life. And we do that through the sacraments. Baptism initiates us into the life of Christ. The Eucharist consummates that initiation. Uh, some people might be might wonder what does it precisely mean to become sin, right? So uh, St. Paul in 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, For he has made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Uh, in the Old Testament, there is a consistent trend of the serpent kind of representing evil, representing sin. But there is also a trend of this serpent being used for something good. And I think that shall give you a basic idea um, about what is going on here, right? So in Genesis 3, uh, Eve says, the serpent beguiled me. And then Exodus uh, 4 in Numbers 21, right? Uh, the, the rod, you know, the serpent becomes a rod. The rod becomes a serpent. Numbers 21, uh, Moses has a serpent of brass. And this, you know, this thing heals people, right? This, uh, this, this thing healed people. Uh, from serpent bites. So it's kind of like an inversion of evil, right? Which is kind of like the main message of the last chapter of Genesis. You taught it for evil, but God taught it for good, right? And so the crucifixion can be taught as kind of being in that manner. If you're still wondering, we can look at the, what, what the church fathers say. St. Gregory the Theologian says, the passage word, the word was made flesh, seems to me to be equivalent to that in which it is said that he was made sin or a curse for us. Not that the Lord was transformed into either of these, how could he be, but because by taking them upon him, he took away our sins and bore our iniquities. St. John Chrysostom likewise says, God allowed his son to suffer as if a condemned sinner, so that we might be delivered from the penalty of our sins. This is God's righteousness, that we are not justified by works, but by grace, in which case all our sin is removed. <clears throat> Ibn al-Qayyim then asks uh, pretty much this question that 
the crucifixion, either Christ consented to it, which will mean that those who crucified him actually did something good, or he did not consent to it, which means that God was overpowered. This is a typical Muslim argument that you hear often. Now, this question is intrinsically tied with the Garden of Gethsemane prayer, which I actually did recently make a video about. So I would recommend you check out this link in the description below or top right of this video if you want a more detailed breakdown of it. It's only 10 minutes. Um, but the basic way I will approach this for the purpose of this video is that Christ was not pleased with death. He, in fact, want, he in fact desired to resist death. Uh, he took on human nature and part of being human is resisting death, which is the separation of the soul from the body. Um, yet, uh, in spite of his appropriation of our condition of fear of death, he still took on, through his same human will, he still took on the passion for our salvation. Christ himself says that he could easily overpower those who murdered him if he chose to, but permits this to happen to fulfill the scriptures. But just because God permits something to happen does not mean that God is pleased that such a thing happened. If that was the case, we will have to say that God willed evil. Well, that is that is ridiculous. How can God, who is goodness himself, will the existence of evil? It doesn't really make any sense now, does it? So <clears throat> the fact that evil exists shows that there can be certain things that happen in the world that God himself does not will. Right, So there is a way that we can answer this question without falling into either conclusion. Then he makes an incredibly bad argument. I mean, I can't stress how honestly terrible this argument is. Um, I'm genuinely surprised that this guy actually thought this is a good argument. Uh, so he basically says, so was the present entity left without a God and all hearing being who can hear prayers and were the heavens vacated when he was placed under the earth and the dirt was above him and was the universe left without a God to manage it while his hands were being nailed down. This is just a ridiculous argument. Um, death is unnatural to God, right? It's, it's unnatural to the divine nature of God because as St. Gregory the Theologian says in Oration 28, um, God is simple, therefore he cannot be divided, therefore he can't dissolve, so he cannot be corrupted in his own nature. <clears throat> so how can God die if death is alien to God's na divine nature? Well, it's because he took on a human body and a human soul. And what is human death? The separation of human body and human soul. So... That shows us that it is quite possible. St. Kirill of Alexandria, for example, says in his second letter to Sukensis, uh, your perfection expounds the rationale of the salvific passion most correctly and very learnedly when you assert that the only begotten Son of God, insofar as he is understood to be and actually is God, did not himself suffer bodily things in his own nature, but suffered rather in his earthly nature. Another good analogy to explain this, I suppose, will be... Um, iron that is on fire being struck by a hammer so if if you if there's let's hypothetically speaking there's an iron that's on fire right it's united with fire and you strike that iron with your hammer well would you be striking the fire just because it's united in some capacity with iron obviously not because it's not proper to the nature of fire to be struck in the manner of an iron is it well, the same goes for Christ. When we speak of mortality and immortality, these are not personal characteristics. So one person who is into, into natures, one of those natures being a mortal nature and the other being an immortal nature, which is his own divine nature, he can go through these two experiences that is proper to these natures. Um, I think a, a very good illustration to show this also will be uh, the body and the soul. Right? A human being is constituted of body and soul. The body is material, but the soul is immaterial. Right? So a man is both material and immaterial. Right? He's material in a bodily manner and he's immaterial in a spiritual manner. Right? So if even a human being can have this kind of a constitution, then it's really not that crazy to say that God can manifest in a human body and soul without going through those uh, human experiences in his own divine nature, but rather in his human nature that he has personally 
united to himself. All right. A great quote that, in my opinion, perfectly explains the mechanics of the two natures in Christ is from St. Athanasius on the Incarnation. He says, The Word was not hedged in by his body, nor did his presence in the body prevent his being present elsewhere as well. So already St. Athanasius refutes this argument. When he moved his body, he did not cease also to direct the universe by his mind and might. No, the marvelous truth is that being the Word, so far from being himself contained by anything, he actually contained all things himself. As with the whole, so also it is with the part. Existing in the human body to which he himself gives life, he is still source of life to all the universe, present in every part of it, yet outside the whole, and he is revealed both through the works of his body and through his activity in the world. It is indeed the function of soul to behold things that are outside the body, but it cannot energize or move them. With the word of God in his human nature, his body was not for him, from, you know, for from him a limitation, but an instrument, so that he was both in it and in all things, and outside all things, resting in the Father alone. At one and the same time, this is the wonder, as man he was living a human life, and as word he was sustaining the life of the universe, and as son he was in constant union with the Father. So the only thing, right, we will say, for example, God is not um, a man, right? Scripture, in fact, says God is not a man, and we will say, yes, God is not a man, right? God in his own nature is not a man. God is not material. God is not mutable, right? <clears throat> but we need to understand, even though we say God is not material, does that mean matter contradicts God? Well, that's a completely different kind of a question. So I will strongly argue to say that what St. Athanasius says is impossible is to deny the omnipresence of God. It's to deny really the omnipotence of God. Because a human body, a, a human being, rather a human nature, right? Human body and soul does not is not contradictory to God. God doesn't have a human body. God doesn't have a human soul. But these are not things that contradict Him. That's a very different thing. The only thing that contradicts God is sin, because sin is the opposition towards God, right? So that's the only thing that's contradictory. So this is why it's important to point out that although Christ took on human nature, he was sinless. So he did not have original, or if you want to call it ancestral sin. He didn't have original sin. So he was not a sinner. He didn't have original sin. But he built to assume blameless passions, right? Passions are a result of the fall, but blameless passions are not sinful, right? Hunger, for example, hunger is an, is an aspect of the fall, right? Prior to the fall, we weren't hungry in the way we get hungry right now. That's one of the examples that we can use. Well, Christ willingly assumed hunger. And in this case, for example, he willingly assumed hunger to deify the experience of fasting for us, right? For our salvific purpose, right? So that's one of the examples that we can use. The point being is that Christ did not have sin. Uh, he willed to have blameless passions. One of those blameless passions, for example, is death right? Uh, then he argues, why didn't the angels help him when they heard him cry out in pain? Uh, Christ, in fact, gives the answer to this question directly. He says, thinkest thou that I cannot now pray to my father and he shall presently give me more than 12 legions of angels? But how then shall the scriptures be fulfilled that thus it might, must be? And what scriptures are to be fulfilled? Well, the Psalms. And guess what? Muslims believe in the Psalms. Right, um, there's in in this poem might in, in in my opinion it's also refer references um, Matthew twenty seven forty six where Christ says My God My God why hast thou forsaken me, and um, I remember when I was you know uh, a new a noob Christian this was kind of like something that was in my mind I was like oh wow you know this is this is a very crazy argument how can you answer this this is really strange but. In, in Psalm 22, the answer is really simple. I mean, Christ is referring to Psalm 22, and guess what? It's Psalm 22, 16. It is speaking about the crucifixion, right? It is speaking about Christ's hands and feet being pierced in his crucifixion. That's one of the scriptures that were to be fulfilled, right? So, I mean, Christ himself, again, as I said, 
directly gives the answer to this argument. So it's it's just bizarre that um, that he uses these kinds of arguments. It's almost like he didn't even read Bible, right? Which is kind of crazy because even you know the Quran itself says that the Bible is a correct book. I know some Muslims don't believe in that. They, they think that's not a correct way to read that verse. But I think the most logical way to understand it is, in fact, it does affirm that we have the book. And the alternative argument is basically saying, oh, well, yes, but you don't have the real Injil. You have the fake corrupt one, which is just ridiculous. I mean, the, the Bible is the most voracious document on earth. I mean, if the Bible is corrupted, then, you know, every document can be assumed to be corrupted as well, right? Uh, it's very difficult to edit, you know, when there's 5,000 manuscripts of something, um, you're going to have to edit 5,000 of these manuscripts. You can't just edit one and go along with it. No, you have to edit all of them. That's the problem with veracity, is that it makes it very difficult to corrupt texts. So veracity allows us to understand that the text as we have received it, there's probably a very high likelihood that it was written in that manner, right? In contrast, there are many texts that we consider to be even unquestionably true, even though there's probably only one or two manuscripts defending it, right? That's, that's an example that we can use. So why don't these people doubt these documents as well? Well, it's because it's they, they only doubt them if it's against Christianity, that's why. Kind of continue on with the poem he then says how could any wooden beam hold up a true god while he's being fastened to it because christ assumed human nature he had a body and a soul uh in his incarnation he has it even still to this day and he will still have it forever um and so since he has manifested his presence in his own body and soul he can be fastened to a wooden beam Right? How could any iron ever be brought to him so that it will be driven inside causing pain? Same exact answer. And how could ever his enemy's hands ever reach him so that they could whip him from behind? Again, same answer because he took on a body and a soul. Right, And the body is something material. It's in a location. You know, um, Muslims, to kind of get go back to this argument, actually quite an important argument. And I have a video against this, but I also want to address it in this video as well. You know, there's, there's this popular argument, basically, again, used by Muslims a lot, where the, they basically say the incarnation is contradictory because God is unlimited, man is limited, right? God is omnipresent, man is mutable. He's in one location and in another location at a time, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So an illustration of the importance of understanding that although God is not material and mutable, et cetera, these don't contradict him. We need to understand the concept of God manifesting his presence, right? In many religions, there is this idea that God manifests his presence in a special manner in some locations, even still to this day, right? But guess what? Manifesting his location, well, that means it's in a location, right? Does that mean that God becomes mutable? No, in his essence, he is not mutable. But that doesn't mean that manifesting in a specific location uh, is contradictory to him, right? If we thought it was contradictory, then that will be impossible, you see. So this is precisely why this distinction is very important, because if you want to attack the incarnation, then you're pretty much going to attack the entire idea that God can communicate with the world at all which will destroy the idea of revelation. Congratulations, by trying to destroy the Christian religion by your silly little arguments, you in fact destroy your own religion by these kinds of arguments. So maybe understand that you might need better arguments. <laughs> I mean, seriously, if you think about it for a couple of minutes, it'll make a lot of sense to you, right? Um, the next argument is, did this Christ revive himself or was there another God that brought him to life? So, I mean, Christ uh, resurrected himself out of his own divine power, right? Again, he is immortal in his divinity, right? Now, his soul uh, descended into Hades after his crucifixion. And St. Peter says in his first epistle, uh, he went and preached unto the spirits in prison, that is, in Hades. 
so he was his soul was there, but again in his divinity he is still omnipresent. He's still omniscient. He's still omnipotent. So he can revive his own body. That is, he can resurrect his own body. What is resurrection? Reuniting the soul with its body, and Christ did that, and he could do that because he had power over over his own soul. And when you kind of explain it, that it seems very, very simple. It seems kind of ridiculous, even to kind of think, wow, you know, how can you even argue against that? At least in my mind. Um, in Against Eunomius Book Five, which I think it's recently brought to my attention, uh, that it, this was not written by Saint Gregory himself. Uh, I'm not hundred percent certain if if I can verify that, but nevertheless. Um, the argument is that it is not the human nature that raises up Lazarus, nor is it the power that cannot suffer that weeps for him when he lies in the grave, so that by reason of contact and the union of natures, the proper attributes of each belong to both. So the point is, the resurrection of Lazarus and the resurrection of Christ's own body is by his own divine power. <clears throat> then he says, how strange is it that a grave could be enclosed on a god? And again, same argument here because he has a body and even stranger is the womb that enclosed him before same response which he remained inside for nine whole months in utter darkness being fed by blood okay this needs to be responded to um definitely uh i think one of jay dyer's debate opponents was a muslim made this argument it's basically like oh in the in birth you're being fed by blood and stuff like that and she just starts talking about really dirty stuff um so we need to understand, first of all, the Virgin Mary, in, in the Orthodox tradition, the Virgin Mary was purified um, either during the Annunciation or during the, concep or during the conception of Christ. Either way, this is prior to Christ being born. So, what is the purification referring to? It is referring to Mary being cleansed of sin. So, <clears throat> this cleansing means that the mode in which Christ was born was in a pre-fallen mode. So being fed by blood, that's an aspect of the fallen mode of being born. Right? Again, think of it as, again, hunger. Right? Uh, we were not physically hungry. You know, we didn't want to eat an animal in, in the garden. Right? The, the pre-fallen mode of human existence is very different than the post-fallen mode of human existence. The birth uh, in which Christ underwent in his humanity of the Virgin Mary is of a pre-fallen kind. So he was not fed by blood. He was not fed by these icky bicky things. This is also why, you know, another Muslim, other Muslims argue, oh, you believe God took a poop. <laughs> no, that is also, you know, pre in the pre-fallen world, Guess what? That didn't exist either. And we can clearly believe, and I think St. Epiphanius, in fact, makes this point, um, we can very easily believe that he didn't, in fact, necessarily do that. So, again, that argument can be responded to once you understand the distinction between the pre-fallen world, which is prior to the sin of Adam, and the post-fallen world, which is after the sin of Adam. All right. Now, again, Christ is without sin, so he did not have original sin. He took on blameless passions, but the blameless passions he took on was not of necessity, but by his, his own will, right? So, um, if Christ decided to poo, all right, it will be by his own will, which is he can choose not to do that. He has the power to choose not to do that, which he probably did not do that because it will kind of be, I will say, contradictory in some sense, right? But... I think that will be sufficient to answer that question. So uh, this is the same thing with like atheist students all as well. You know, they will say, oh, well, Christ is a human being. So if Christ is really human, then he must have had, you know, opinions on, you know, sexual matters, basically, you know, like uh, in the least crude way possible. Like I've seen blasphemous memes like that and posts like that. And it's, it's like, you know, just because we affirm that Christ is really the most human of all of us because he was without sin. Right? It's really us that fall short of being humans. So maybe perhaps instead of uh, treating Christ as he must conform to our humanity, maybe we must conform our humanity to Christ. Well, you know, I think that's a much better way of 
looking at things. Uh, then he says, then he emerged from the womb as a small child, completely helpless, reaching out to be fed. Thus he ate, drank, and after he answered the call, which comes naturally. So is this really a God? Again, it's actually quite important to argue that Christ was an infant because it means he also deified and glorified that stage of human life. Christ went through all uh, developments, de developmental stages of human life. Right? That is to sanctify that, which is, by the way, off topic, but this is why we baptize infants as well, because Christ himself was an infant, and baptism is an entrance of life in Christ. So, bearing that in mind, infants shall be baptized. Right uh, Now, uh, I think this has in mind somewhat with, with, uh, in Luke 2.52, which uh, states, Jesus increased in wisdom and stature, and in, fa in favor with God and man. <clears throat> now, again, since Christ has a human nature, he has also a human will, human energy, that is human activities, and he also has human faculties, such as mind, and with mind comes knowledge, so he also has human knowledge. And so uh, he did not increase in wisdom and stature due to necessity, but he appropriate or state to deify and heal or condition on earth which part of that is growing in wisdom and knowledge. So that's part of, you know, assuming all stages of the development of a human being. Um, to kind of, before I get to the argument that I repeated before as well, uh, another way of looking at it, well, does God give us wisdom? Does God give us knowledge? Well, if, again, if you're, whether you're Muslim or Jewish, you know, you shall say yes to that question, but would, would you say that God instantly gives his entire wisdom to you? Obviously not, right? There's a process to it. It's the same thing with Christ's humanity. There was still a process to it. So we can accept that for human beings, and so we can also accept that for Christ. And I think a good way of looking at it, because some people might not like what I said, because, oh, it seems like you're saying that God can cease to be omniscient in one sense. Um, this is I, what I'm saying is a non-absolute limitation. It's non-absolute because it does not infringe on his characteristic of being all-knowing. Again, Christ in his divinity is still all-knowing, but rather since he is omnipotent, right? He is also able without limiting his omniscience in an absolute manner, he is able and he has the power to also genuinely experience the state of growing in wisdom and stature. These experiences are not evil. These are not evil experiences. And since they're not evil experiences, they do not contradict his divine nature. Again, they don't contradict his divinity. Whatever does not contradict God's essential character is not, <laughs> right? is something that we can attribute to God in some sense. So uh, St. Gregory of Nyssa makes a great art argument against this. In his great catechism, chapter 9, he says, Let them demonstrate that the birth, the upbringing, the growth, the advance towards natural maturity, the experience of death, and the rising from death are vicious, that is, sinful. Alternatively, if they claim that the things we mentioned are free of vice, they will necessarily agree that foreignness to vice is in no way shameful. And so if these things are foreign to vice then God can assume these conditions. But if they are, you know, uh, if they are vicious, if they are sinful things, well, then you end up being Gnostic by saying, well, human beings are naturally evil, right? And I don't think that's, a, that's an argument that you want to end up causing yourself to be in. So ultimately, the only choice you have, the only choice, the one choice you have is to actually accept the possibility of the Incarnation. But that completely destroys the Muslim system that Ibn al-Qaim is trying to defend, because if Christianity can, be, can possibly be true, then it necessarily has to be true, because the entire basis of Islam is really a... one of the entire bases of Islam is that it's a rejection of Christianity. If Christianity can possibly be true, then... And this, the scripture is also affirmed, and the scripture, you know, is consistent with the Christian faith. And the scripture does genuinely say, and, and can be affirmed, 
with the belief of the Holy Trinity and belief of Christ being God and man simultaneously, then Islam just cannot be true. Absolutely cannot be true. But it, by the way, neither can neither can Judaism, right? So that is what's at stake ultimately. <clears throat> and uh, then he says, "High exalted is Allah above the lives of the Christians, each of whom will be asked about their fabrications." Oh yeah, uh, can't wait to be asked about by your, you know, whatever. <laughs> Uh, oh, cross worshippers. So now a mischaracterization. I mean, it's a, like when you mischaracterize and lie about our position, call us cross worshippers and stuff like that. Do you really think that I'm going to be scared when you say that I'm going to be asked about? Perfect, like, you're, you're not giving me a good example of your religion by doing that. Again, you know, you're not giving me a good reason to actually be fearful of the kind of threat that this person is making. So we will be asked about our fabrications. And then right afterwards, he fabricates a belief about us. He says we are cross worshippers. <laughs> How ridiculous is this person? Like, seriously. I mean, do these people not actually read and think about what he says for a second? And this is a clear contradiction. For what reason is someone exalted for accepting this and blameworthy for rejecting it? And is it not logical that we shall break and burn what humiliated Christ and the one that made it? Since you claim that God was forcefully crucified upon it, with his hands nailed to it, for truly what a cursed cross to carry, which one shall discard instead of kissing when glanced upon? So the first thing I will say is that if we become cross worshippers because we kiss the cross, because that's the argument he is using, then you you know you're you're black cube worshippers by that logic. You you know look, I live in Turkey. I I know people who go to Hajj. It's very unsanitary. People do a lot of a lot of veneration, that's the nicest way I can put it. They do a lot of veneration. The black cube, right? The magic cube. So we kiss crosses, we kiss images, and we become image worshippers, and we become cross worshippers because of that. So what does that make you? What does that make you, dude? Seriously, what does that make you? What do you think that it makes you? I mean, it's, it's flabbergasting that... that there are people that actually make these kinds of arguments and you see them and you kind of ask yourself, are these people like, what, are, do these people have a double digit IQ even? Like, you know, triple, it's impossible. They can't have a triple digit IQ. So they, they must have double digit. But this makes you question, but maybe they don't even have double digit IQ. Maybe it's not even positive IQ. Maybe it's just in the negatives, right? Maybe it's just like the more illogical arguments you make, the higher your negative, well, I guess in, in this case, it will be lower, right? The lower your negative IQ goes. I think that's, that's pretty much what happens. So anyways, aside from, aside from that, um, I will say that the cross is in no way different from symbolically different from the sword, which is used in many Islamic flags. Um, the reason why Islamic nations and cultures, you know, use the use a sword as a symbol is that it signifies authority, it signifies conquest, it signifies, you know, power, right? So we will say that the cross also signifies authority, also signifies power. And just like the sword, the cross is also a weapon. But the sword, the thing about the sword is that it's a temporal weapon. It will only give you temporal power, it will only give you temporal glory. The cross is not merely temporal. It is eternal, fundamentally of an eternal characteristic because the cross that Christ was crucified on is a weapon against death. Remember, Christ took sin in his own body and he descended into Hades. Imagine, for example, sin. Sin is, a, sin is darkness. And Christ descends into a cave full of darkness and he is the light. What do you think is going to happen? Sin is going to run away. Darkness is going to run away. Because darkness is merely the absence of light. Uh, similar to that, sin is the absence of good. When goodness himself appears in Hades, that is the destruction of death. And so again, you know, some people might say, well, you say all of these fanciful things, but people still die, right? Well, that's because those people still have, you know, there's still original sin. But what we're talking about is that if you want to participate in that eternal life, 
right? That Christ has acquired to you. You have to, by your own free choice and of your own free will, to participate in that life in Christ to eternally live with Him, right? That is what is possible to us by faith through grace. And some people might, for example, David, you're Orthodox. You sound like a lot, of, lot like Protestants. Like, you know, well, I will say, for example, we will believe that faith has inherent characteristics and it is energized by works such as love, right? As St. Paul says, I have a video uh, that talks about this called Essence and Energy's Distinction in the Bible. Nevertheless, get back to the point. The cross, we will see the cross is a weapon. And the cross, the crucifixion itself is also typified in the binding of Isaac. Um, let's look at the, let's look at, the similarities of the story. Isaac is Abraham's only begotten son. Christ is God's only begotten son, right? Uh, the the father, you know, sacrifices Christ. The father was, you know, Abraham was about to sacrifice his son Isaac, and he was carried on wood, and he was going to be sacrificed on wood. And the cross itself is also wooden, and in a sense, Isaac was resurrected by God's declaration. And he was substituted with a ram that was caught in a ticket by his horns, signifying the crown of thorns that Christ wore. So there's a lot of typology in the binding of Isaac, which we will say that is prefiguring Christ. Then he says, For you claim the creature creator was abused upon it, yet you appear to worship it, so are you one of his enemies. So as I said, um, we do not worship the cross, we venerate the cross. <clears throat> so the cross is ultimately an instrument against death. That is why we venerate it. That is why we consider it very special and very important for us Christians. And this is why it is exalted. Not merely because it carried Christ, but, but because it is the instrument that Christ used to defeat the evil one. And that will end my presentation and refutation of Ibn al-Qayyim and his poem against Christians. If you like this video, make sure to like it, uh, subscribe if you haven't, share it to your friends if you want them to check this content out. And uh, if you really super, super like this video and my content, you can you know support me in a myriad of ways by sharing my videos, by being a Patreon financier. Speaking of Patreon financiers, I would like to give, give shout outs to them. Uh, thank you to Tim, Brian, uh, Brian with a Y, Brian with an I, Marco, Diet Soda Lights, Allison, Eddie, Father Justin, Node, Maximus, Mitch, Jonathan, Vlad, Kerry, Ignatius, Mike, Jack, Nectarius, Flooded Basement, Dave, Seraphim, and Norbert. Thank you all for being my Patreon financiers and thank you all for watching this video. I'll see you all in the next video. Thank you for watching. May God be with you all. Goodbye.